I'd like to start this talk by saying a sentence that I'm never going to be able to say again for the rest of my life. I'm giving a talk today in Sofia, Bulgaria, and Las Vegas, Nevada, in the same day. Isn't technology wonderful? Um, or as was pointed out to me, I'm sort of gambling with this. Um, so on the subject of location, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk today about the multi-dimensional niche space of life, which is something that's been sort of a side passion of mine. Um, since the dawn of humans, we've wondered, are we alone in the universe? But how do we hunt for life? And it's been pointed out to me by hunters that it's really much like hunting for anything else. You have to prepare before the trip. And one of the big things for us is to know what we're hunting for, and that's not trivial. If you're going to hunting for a deer, you know what a deer looks like. If you're going to hunt for life, you have no idea what it looks like. It becomes a much more serious problem. You need permits. You can think in terms of planetary protection officers. You need a vehicle to get there and so on, a plan. Once you um, have all that in place, you go, you arrive, you do reconnaissance, you hunt, you shoot it, you bag it, you go home. But today we're going to focus on the before the trip aspect and again make the analogy for looking for life elsewhere. So where should we go? And again, if you're hunting for deer, that's fairly trivial. I would recommend my yard for a start. Um, but it's not so trivial when you're looking for life elsewhere. And it obviously depends where life can originate and subsequently evolve. And there have been a lot of really fabulous talks today on places where life could originate. And I am very grateful for all the talks this morning because that did a far better job than I ever could have. So we're going to focus more in my talk then on what happens once you have life. Um, however, there are limits to where you can find life and where life can live because life is based on organic carbon and using water as a solvent. But is this always true? Well, I happen to be a great believer in carbon, and I don't know if there are alternative views in the room. I know that there are people who have alternative views. But I'm very much fixed to carbon because it is so common in our universe, or it's the most common element. Um, I love this periodic table that the astronomers use. It is so much more intuitive than the ones that we biologists had to learn. And what's really fascinating is when you look at the relative proportions in the universe of the various elements, it maps not too badly into the main ones that we use um, for living organisms. Obviously, we don't use helium, but other than that, it maps pretty well. Now, obviously, carbon is really interesting chemically. It can form all sorts of um, long-chain carbon compounds all the way to DNA and so on. Um, and we found interesting carbon chemistry out in the interstellar medium on comets and meteorites, nothing that anyone here doesn't know. And so it leaves me with this feeling that maybe there are students around Alpha Centauri or whoever that are using basically the same biochemistry book that we're using. And the point of this is not saying that I have a lack of imagination, but to start from first principles and see where you can go and what the universe is telling us. Now, why water? Um, I once did an opening for a water conference, and I came up with about 23 reasons why water. That was in the Netherlands. But um, the main thing is the water really is a fabulous um, solvent. It's got a lot of fabulous properties, um, including being less dense when it's solid. Um, and it also is liquid at a much higher temperature than the alternatives. Obviously, there's lots of it around, and we can even imagine it forming in um, solar systems and Again, there were talks this morning that showed where the icy bodies were. Of course, we have the problem of Titan, which challenges our faith in liquid water. Um, we can always go towards the subsurface where there should be water that becomes liquid with impacts, but obviously it is very tempting to try to hypothesize another solvent based on Titan. Um, I don't personally believe that there would be another solvent for life because, again, the problem of the temperature, that you would be so cold that reaction rates would be so slow that it would be very, very difficult to literally keep body and soul together. But again, all these points are ones that we could discuss at great lengths tonight. So to search for life, we need to know the limits for life on Earth. And to that, we turn to extremophiles. Um, and what's interesting is we're not just turning to extremophiles. 
files today, even though I wrote a paper on it for Nature about 20 years ago, but actually this approach goes way back into the 19th century. Richard Proctor in 1870 wrote a book, Other Worlds Than Ours, and pretty much this was chapter by chapter going through the different planets in our solar system, literally starting with Mercury, and trying to map it to um, places on the Earth. We know so much more about extreme files now. Obviously, we know vastly more about the environment. But the, this whole approach of if we range over the Earth from the Arctic zones to the Torrid zones, we find none of the peculiarities which mark the several regions of our globe suffice to banish life from its surface. So again, it, a very old approach, but still a good one. We turn to extreme files because they give us the minimum envelope for life. And I, I have to say that Remind you that extremophiles are not organisms that live in places that are unpleasant to take a field trip to, for example, the cave, but these are literally organisms that have to deal with the extremes that make it very difficult to, again, keep body and soul together if you were going to be based on organic carbon using water as a solvent. And this is something that is um, very highly polyphyletic. Um, the ability to live in extreme environments has evolved over and over and over again. Here's basically a, a fairly recent taxonomic tree of life, and what I did is highlight some of the branches with orange circles where there are known extremophiles. So again, you can see this is highly polyphyletic. And so what um, environments are we talking about? We're talking about temperature, um, and we have great examples of organisms that are metabolically active down to minus 20 or so. Um, you can keep human embryos in liquid nitrogen, so that's different from being metabolically active, all the way to 121 or so, pH ranging from 0 to 12.5-ish. There are reports um, below pH 0, which you actually can do. Um, desiccation, obviously an extreme environment if you've got an organism based on liquid water as a solvent. Salinity extremes, chemical extremes, pressure extremes. Radiation, which is really one of the most interesting ones because it's both a selective agent as well as a mutagen. And one that a lot of people don't think of, and again, I partly put this in here because of the geologists in the room, and that is oxygen. Um, I, I do have colleagues who are very kindly trying to find me a place with oxygen, and honestly, we don't need oxygen. Oxygen is a really great strategy for metabolism. No one in this room should stop breathing at this point. It makes us metabolically efficient, but it's also extremely dangerous in that we have these reactive oxygen species that are intermediates in reactions that cause enormous amounts of damage to your DNA, your proteins, and your lipids. And that's a whole other story. But the fact is that all of those are extreme environments. Now, this is a story I've been giving for a long time, and this is a very sort of one-dimensional, two-dimensional, you know, vision of life, but the fact is that we all are living in multiple environmental parameters. So we live in a certain pH, temperature, oxygen. I don't quite know how to show this graphically um, without one of those sort of five star whatever, but um, this is just to give you that idea that we all range. So when something's an extremophile, it may be particularly good at living at low temperature, but terrible at a certain range of pH. And so we started to try to map this by going to the literature, and it turns out it's very difficult because people report their data in different ways, they're interested in different things. So I put together this paper with some students at Stanford a few years ago, um, and about the best we could do is really tease out pH versus temperature. And what I've done is color-coded by the three main domains of life, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukarya, and some pictures sort of giving you an idea of what those environments might look like. And the really interesting thing here, besides the fact that all the really high temperature ones are archaea, is that there seems to be a gap at this low pH and the low temperature. And so you ask yourself, is it because nothing has evolved under those conditions, or there's nothing that was sampled, or maybe just nothing that was reported, or are there some th things about certain combinations of environments that preclude life? And it's quite possible that not all combinations are compatible. So for example, if you look at membrane fluidity, and for this I actually just imagine a bar of butter, and at low pressure, you get increased fluidity of membranes. 
At low temperature, you get reduced fluidity. So again, think of a stick of butter being put in the freezer versus melting out on, on the stove. And then you add the low pH. And in general, there's increased fluidity, although doing yet another literature search last night on the infinitesimally small amount of literature available on this subject, um, it shows that there is some variability. Usually at low pH, there's increased fluidity, but there are a few counterexamples. Proton impermeance takes precedence over the fluidity. So it shows that in general, if you have increased fluidity at low pH and at low temperature reduced fluidity, that could explain why we're not seeing organisms in that low pH, low temperature region. And so it's sort of moving along on how you would search for life, and you need to know what you're looking for. We touched on that a little bit. Finding the limits for life, touched on that a little bit. And then normally you would go map these extreme files to other habitable bodies. Um, at this point, I would normally go through these different habitable bodies, but I certainly don't need to in this group. Um, just remind you that there are plenty of suspect places in our solar system and beyond. Um, so we we'll move on to this last step, and this is where you have come up with, you, the astronomers, have come up with places that you think should be habitable. Um, but maybe they're a bit off. Well, I have this great planet, but I think that the temperature would be well over 120, or just a little bit over 120, or just a little, you know, this or that, or maybe you go into deep freezes because of the eccentricity of the orbit, or whatever. And this is the point that you then turn to someone who does synthetic biology, and I switch hats here, and say, okay, maybe we can actually make an organism that could live in these environmental conditions. And um, so we asked, why not create a synthetic extremophile? And this is a project that we started uh, 10 years ago, and the students call it the Hell Cell Project, which I love. I've repeated that up at the White House. They love it, too. Um, different administration. Anyway, this was the group um, of students um, who worked on the Hell Cell Project originally. This was an IGEM team, the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, which is a um, competitive synthetic biology competition primarily for undergraduates. There's overgrad division, high school division, and actually the competition starts today, I believe, in Paris. Um, I do not have a team this year, but for 10 years I did have a fabulous team of students. And four of these students said that they wanted to do this house out project and came up with this toolbox to, of genes to look at increasing desiccation, radiation resistance, um, pH tolerance, heat tolerance, and cold tolerance in E. coli, which is a, your basic lab rat bacterium. It's a wimp that lives in your gut primarily, and that's a fairly steady environment. And I looked at that list, and certainly 10 years ago, that seemed highly ambitious for four students for three months. And, you know, reverse psychology, for those of you who are parents, you know, if you tell someone they can't do something, they're going to work two times or five times harder to prove that you're wrong. And they did. They got to every one of these genes. And the answer is this kind of approach works very nicely. So here are the results from desiccation resistance, and you can see First, the control bar. This is um, basic E. coli. Um, didn't have any extra genes added. The percent survival under desiccation was pretty poor. When you add the trebolose by synthetic operon, it went up. The glycine beta E, which is in green, it went up quite a bit. And oddly enough, the manganese transporter also went up quite a bit. We were using that for no good rational reason, except that we were using it for other capabilities and in other projects. And so they tried it, and it was surprisingly good. So this kind of approach to start to build synthetic extremophiles is something that's, that's relatively easy. And so this is something, as I said, is a renewed passion of mine. For 10 years, I've been talking about this. And then about a year ago, I very fortunately got a new NASA postdoctoral fellow um, who's in the back of the room. And he has picked up the Health Cell Project again, looking through this adaptive laboratory evolution, which we'll talk about in a minute through motivated, he calls it, or I would call it targeted synthetic biology, so again, think health cell, and through functional metagenomic screening. And because I didn't have a picture of him until only a few minutes ago, 
and I did tell him that there is never a bad time to show a picture of a puppy. There's Garrett's puppy. If you want to see Garrett live, he's right in the middle of the room raising his hand. And you should talk to him about this work um, that I'm going to be presenting for the rest of the talk on Thursday when he has his post drop. So adaptive laboratory evolution is basically thinking Darwin in a test tube. You, you take subsamples and you run some sort of selection. Or you can think of Garrett on Mars. And this is the kind of thing that Garrett's done already, looking at evolution for salt um, tolerance, for chlorate tolerance, UV tolerance, which has been done by quite a few people. And there's the original strain grade. So you can see over time, you can get quite a bit of enhancement of tolerance. Yes, Darwin still works. And the, um, you can go to the literature, same approach as the iGEM team work one gene at a time. The problem is you can't always do this one gene at a time if you're going to start to angst about the multidimensional niche space of life. So I just put together this graph to give you an idea. Just imagine, for example, that orange bar was pH. And you have a peak at one particular level, and that happens to be at a certain temperature. So then you go to the temperature, and you switch the <laughs> you, you take that pH, and you switch temperature, and you discover that you've moved now on the graph. So you really need to end up doing a matrix to find an optimum because you can't always take single environmental parameters. And so you start to have to do additive work, and it, it becomes more complicated. But that's how you wend your way through, and that's how evolution works, wending its way through local maxima. Um, and so now we move on to functional metagenomic screening. And again, with the thought, why we evolve the capability when we can just pull from nature's genetic hardware store? And so this approach that I've been giving you before with the iGEM team is looking at one gene at a time. And that's, again, very effective. But it's not going to get you where you want to, and that is to evolve a Europan. And so Garrett is looking at many genes at a time, um, doing a completely different approach, something that um, one or two other groups have done for, for other sorts of reasons. And that is going to a whole community, either going to a whole genome or a whole community of genomes. And what you're doing is you're cloning genes, and you're looking for them to express in a host cell and provide the characteristics that you want and select, and then you can go back and figure out which genes you selected for. And so it's, it's actually very clever because you're doing this at a phenotypic level. There's no point in sequencing everything if 99.9% you know, .9 of what you're pulling out doesn't work. You only focus on what has actually already worked in an organism. And so this has um, been a very interesting approach. You can basically do two different things. You can do reverse transcription of the, um, the messenger RNA. Um, and we've done some of that with very, very mixed success. Or you can simply go in and chop up whole genomes. And we've had much more success with that. And so the suggestion from that result is that clearly you need often more than one gene or you're missing promoters or whatever um, when you're just doing cDNA and hoping that that works. Now, um, things like gene dosage also makes a difference. This is um, a slide from Garrett's work again. And um, it's, the point of this is showing that UV resistance is highly sensitive to copy number. And so what he did was look for ultraviolet radiation resistance among um, the different organisms that he had transformed with this functional metagenomic approach and found that it was always the RECA gene that was providing this um, radiation resistance. And the, the segment of DNA that he had ended up cloning into these organisms was 35 kilobases. But he could subclone a 3 kilobase region. And that worked fine. But then, um, and there you go, um, there's a 3 kilobase fragment right next to the 35. And you can see they're pretty much the same. But when you start um, looking at copy number, you increase the copy number to a medium copy number, it actually was less resistant. And when you had a very high gene dosage, it was even less. And so that is perhaps counterintuitive, but it shows that you do need to sort of work on all these parameters. It's not just obvious. You can't just say, more is better. We'll take this and this and put it together, and everything's going to work. You do need to be kind of cagey about this. 
So in finishing, we could just simply take what nature has already wrought, and nature has wrought quite a bit. I mean, we have over 10 million variants of organisms today, not to mention quite a few in the past, some of which are at least the genetics we can reconstruct through ancestral gene reconstruction, so it's not completely lost, we can hypothesize ancestral genes. So we have quite a number of variants available on that genetic hardware store, but of course we are limited to using certain um, amino acids and certain bases and so on, and there may be better ones. Um, I don't know how many of you know Victor Pinheiro, who's done some really amazing work on XNAs, and he's the kind of wonderful chemist who looks at nucleic acids and I say, I need something that will survive on the surface of Mars. I want it to be more radiation resistant. Oh, you just add this double bond here, and we take out that carbon, we move that here. And so it does give you great faith that there may be very different approaches that one could use. And so um, less for the interest of evolutionary biology and really more for the interest of synthetic biology, there are various groups in various countries that are very interested in creating life de novo, build a cell groups. And um, this has worked out very well because Kate Alamal is going to be speaking right after me, and I know she's going to be telling you about at least the um, group that she leads that, that is based in the United States, but we have members from all over. And so why not start all over again? Maybe this is going to be the best approach to create a titanium. Is that the, the correct word for it? Um, by starting from scratch rather than trying to use these house cell approaches. So in summary, the environment matters, and that's really the whole point of this talk, that you can't just think about the sigma catalog in a test tube. That's not the way the real world works. That's not the way life originated. That's not the way it evolved. Um, on the other hand, we don't know the environment in which life arose, although there were very many very persuasive arguments today, um, but obviously not in a test tube. And we really don't know the niche space for life on Earth today. I mean, that's the amazing thing. I've asked this question over and over, and we really don't know. How high does the biosphere go? We have some data way up in the atmosphere from ballooning experiments. It's not very complete. We have some data from deep down in the ocean. It is not complete. I mean, we do not know for sure about these reports of Nicaraguan microbes at minus pH 2. It's really quite fascinating that even in this day and age, we don't actually know what the niche space is for life on Earth, much less elsewhere. And this is really important for looking for life elsewhere. And so I would suggest the solution is more ecological studies, which was sort of a strange conclusion that I hadn't expected to come up with for this talk, but that's clearly true. We need to know more about life on Earth. But I also do believe that synthetic biology is going to be enormously helpful, both um, in the origin of life as well as learning the limits to life, and I guess this is really ties in with the origin of life, understanding alternate compositions for life. Thank you very much. strategies for the you know, creating the art. It, it seemed like there were two strategies that, for my mind, would have been best combined. There's the, you know, picking the, the circuit or the protein out of an existing extremophile, but that runs the risk of sort of the incompatibility, or, or you're not quite matching the existing circuitry or other parts of the circuit. And then there's the purely evolution, you know, laboratory evolution, which really has trouble inventing new proteins on the time scale you're willing to do that experiment, it can modify existing proteins. So is there a way to combine those two approaches to sort of create libraries where you've put in those extra extremophile genes, but then you let you know, bacteria or whatever you're doing with uh, mutate, recombine under some artificial rec recommendation strategy? Yes, That's absolutely. I should have put it in a slide. That's exactly what we do. Yes, right. but, but is there a way to combine those two strategies? Yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah. yeah. so you, you do a rough cut by putting new genes right. in. Right, that's what I was asking. Yes. yes, absolutely. Okay, so and, and then you can take, you know, you can grind up the cells and recombine. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Yes. No, no I'm, I'm probably the biggest Darwin fan in the room. <laughs> so, you know, always, always some evolutionary approaches.
or at least uh, mid some year. University of Minnesota it uh, was more or less the same question and let me try to, to create another one. Um, uh, have you tried a purely evolution experiment where you go uh, uh, a mini culture and you apply slowly a slice and you select each time the survival or is it out of question because of time scales and, and things like that? Oh no, absolutely. We do that sort of thing and I showed one of Garrett's slides. Um, as you probably know, Rich Lenski has been doing that sort of approach, not for um, extreme files, but that sort of evolution approach um, with E. coli for what is he now up to? 25? 25, 25 years. 25 years. Um, I've been to his lab, they do this manually. I mean, it's insane. There's someone there literally every day subculturing. I mean, it, it's, it's crazy. And, well, you know, you're at the University of Minnesota, there's been the wonderful work um, that's been done there on creating artificial, um, well, not artificial, but creating multicellular yeast, which is you know, fascinating work, too. Same sort of approach of, of using adaptive laboratory evolution. Yeah, I think one of your graphs, you control spontaneously at some point after a few tens of hours to show some resistance, right? If, if I remember correctly, the slide was, was relatively fast. Gary, you want to answer that? Yeah, there was growth. I wouldn't call it resistance. It was more like it grew very slowly. It had a long lifetime and then eventually grew at a slower rate than the evolved populations. So I, I think my point of this is that there are many people like Lenski who've worked at this for many years. And obviously evolution has been at it for roughly four billion years. And I think my point is how quickly you can start to push um, the niche space for organisms using these various approaches. Um, and again, we've, we've only been back at this for, for about a year, not even that because of the uh, shutdown with COVID. Yeah, I uh, great talk, Lars Bouquet, DCU Space at the Technical University of Denmark. So this is one of the main uh, questions from an astronomer here. Uh, I wonder, so, so you talk about survival of life, but also origin of life, and I wonder if you would comment a bit on that, because it seems like life can survive on a wide range of you know, parameters, but can it also originate in a wide range of uh, parameters? Do you have any, any Exactly, and I was actually, I was pulling out slides during lunch, because I haven't expected such wonderful talks this morning talking about the location. But there's, you know, there, we do tend to give talks like this on where life can survive. And, you know, normally if I had an hour, I would show you locations with high temperature and low temperature and high pH and low pH and all those sorts of things. But that always begs the question of what the environment for the origin of life was, unless you want to have it originate in one location and then move to the next. And so my point is you have to worry about having the sequence at the same place or a mechanism for transfer of organisms, meteorite, cometary, whatever. And again, it's, my, it, it's not that sophisticated point, but it's a point that I think people tend to forget that you need to worry about the location for all these. You need to worry about the environment. Um, excellent talk, thank you. Um, Anton Petrov, uh, Georgia Tech, Atlanta. Uh, actually, my question echoes a uh, previous question from Lars. And uh, let me ask you, maybe, and you can elaborate on that. Uh, to what extent do you think the uh, conditions that existed at the origins of life imposed some constraints on evolution of life and the limits of evolution. So let's say we know if life on Earth evolved and the DNA RNA based and all the remaining life contains those molecules, uh, the limits uh, may be limited by a, a history of the origins. So, and then how your approach of uh, developing a synthetic life would be Overcome this question. So you're absolutely right. I mean, um, as someone pointed out this morning, life is all about um, history. That's what makes it different from other sciences. It's, it's you know, life is historical. It depends what's come before. So the origin of life is going to set certain parameters on the trajectories for the evolution of life, and that's the point. Is if you have a bottom-up, you know, life 2.0, as I like to call it. 
you can start with different parameters and therefore have different directions that you might be able to go. That being said, with synthetic biology, we can do certain tricks to maybe make jumps that would not naturally occur. Um, and more than just genes, you know, for example, recoding the genome to pick up new amino acids. But these are relatively minor compared to, say, setting up an organism that had an inside-out membrane or used a completely different um, genetic material or used, uh, well, you could probably do the other amino acids, but you know, there are lots of, lots of things that would be very difficult to do. And I hate to use the word, but as they say synthetic biology in, the, in a chassis that has already evolved. Um, and again, Kate's gonna, I know, talk much more about synthetic cells, so I don't wanna steal her. Um, Hi, Sky White from uh, Cambridge University. I was just wondering, you mentioned the gap for um, the low pH, low temperature. Using this project, do you think you will be able to create an extreme bar that could maybe survive at lower temperatures and pHs at the same time, or is this not possible? I, well, <laughs> I was more worried about it um, until I found these two papers last night showing some exceptions on the membrane fluidity, which really is an issue. So I think that we can do that. I really do, and I, I, I wish I'd, I'd tried before we got here, um, but I think we're going to be able to pull it off. Thank you. As good as this is, I will request that the further ones be taken up offline, and we thank them again. <laughs>